Welcome to another tutor short provided by the Educational Support Services Department of Lehigh Carbon Community College in Snexville, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Allentown. These videos review key learnings for the science courses provided here at LTRIC. And please remember that the Educational Support Services Department does provide walk-in tutoring five days a week. Hello and welcome to the Anatomy and Physiology 1 tutor short. We will be going over the pectoral girdle and upper extremities. This will be given by your tutors, Laura Heck and Kim Rylander. Here we see the pectoral girdle, upper arm, forearm, and hand, which is a part of the appendicular skeleton. We see how all bones articulate with one another in this photo. This is a photo taken from our science lab of the pectoral girdle. In this slide we will go over the structures of the clavicle. The clavicle, also known as the collarbone, is a slender, doubly curved bone which convects forward on its medial two-thirds and concave laterally. Convex forward and concave laterally. The medial end, or the sternal end, is located here. This attaches to the sternal manubrium. The lateral end, or the acromial end, is flattened where it articulate with the scapula to form the shoulder joint located here. To tell the difference if you're looking at the superior or the inferior view of the clavicle, Note the conoid tubercle located here. This is found in the posterior inferior surface of the clavicle. This is a handy landmark for determining whether a given clavicle is from the right or left side of the body. The clavicle serves as an anterior brace to hold the arm away from the top of the thorax. We are now looking at the anterior and posterior sides of the scapula. This is also known as our shoulder blades, which are generally triangular and are commonly called the wings of the humans. On the anterior side, we can clearly see the coracoid process located here. Looking on the anterior side, we see the subscapular fossa located here. On both sides, anterior and posterior, we can identify all of our borders. Here we see the superior border, the medial border, the lateral border, our inferior angle and our superior angle. Looking at the posterior side, we have our infraspinous fossa located here. This is our spine of the scapula. Above the spine, we have the supraspinous fossa located in here. The spine continues to become the acromion process. Looking at the lateral aspect of the scapula, we can identify the glenoid cavity. We can also see the supraspinous fossa located in here the spine of the scapula to the acromion process and the coracoid process. We are now looking at the anterior and posterior views of the humerus. The head of the humerus is located here, which will articulate to the glenoid cavity of the scapula. The head is separated from the shaft of the humerus 
by the anatomical neck located here versus our surgical neck located here. Our greater tubercle is located here. followed by the lesser tubercle located here. In between the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle is our intertubercular sulcus located here. We can also see the deltoid tuberosity located here. Moving distally on the humerus, we can see the medial epicondyle, the lateral epicondyle, the trochlea, the capitulum, the radial fossa, and the coronoid fossa. The trochlea will articulate with the ulna, while the capitulum will articulate with the head of the radius. Looking on the posterior side, we can see the olecranon fossa, where the olecranon process of the ulna will fit into. We can also see the lateral supracondyle ridge located here and the medial supracondylar ridge located here. To identify if we're looking at the right or left humerus, we will look for where the head and the medial epicondyle are facing. These will want to face in medially. and the olecranon fossus will be in the back. This will make this humerus my right humerus. In this picture, we can see how the ulna and the radius fit together to make our forearm. Here we can see the proximal radial ulnar joint. and distally we can see the distal radial ulnar joint. We will now look at each of these bones individually and discuss their structures. This is the anterior and medial side of the ulna. The ulna is the medial bone of the forearm. Starting at the proximal end, we can locate our olecranon process, the trochlear notch, which will make the U for the ulna, the coronoid process. We see the radial notch of the ulna located here. Since the radial notch is facing this way, meaning the radius has to fit on the lateral side of the ulna, we can identify this as the left ulna. Looking at the medial side, we can see the ulnar styloid process located there. Now we are looking at the anterior and posterior views of the radius. Here is the head of the radius followed by the neck of the radius and the radial tuberosity located here. Looking distally, we can see the radiostyloid process. Located here on the posterior view, we can see the ulnar notch of the radius, where the head of the ulna will articulate with the radius. We are now looking at the anterior and posterior views of the hand. We will now go over the carpals. In the proximal row going laterally to medially, we have scaphoid located here and here, lunate located here and here, triquetrum located here, with pisiform being on top of triquetrum, located here. We cannot see it on this on the posterior side. 
pisiform will indicate you are on the anterior side because it sticks up significantly. Now looking at the distal row of carpals, we will start with trapezium located above the scaphoid. Next we have the trapezoid, capitate, and lastly hamate. These are all the carpal bones in our wrist. They are bound closely together by ligaments, so their movement is very restricted between them. We will now move into metacarpals, which are numbered 1 through 5, starting from the thumb side of the hand. Next, we have the phalanges, which are also numbered 1 through 5, in the same fashion as the metacarpals, starting with the thumb, or the pollux, of the hand. The phalanges consist of the proximal, middle, and distal, except for the thumb, which only has proximal and distal. Thank you for watching. To view any of the models or if you have any questions, please come to the Science Lab in SH150 in the Educational Support Services Center. Thank you.